Yo, what's up? How we doing? I, I, how many of you at all of our campuses were at Encore last week? Anybody at Encore last week? All together? I, I think there's just something cool about being together with other campuses and realizing that like the world doesn't just revolve around your campus. There's something awesome about that. Hopefully you were encouraged. And I, I don't know where you're at, but at this campus, Peoria, Matt just did a communion where he talked about Mexico. And I just feel like I wanna say boldly, if you haven't been to Mexico, like what are you waiting for? Uh, if you find someone who has been to Mexico and you ask them what it was like and if it made an impact on their life, I don't think you'd find someone that wouldn't say that it did. And I think it's worth your effort to get on that trip. Come hang, I'm gonna be there, I'm gonna, I'm gonna hang out, it's gonna be awesome, come party, come build a house in Mexico, it's gonna be sweet. Uh, we'd love to have you. For a lot of you, we think that would be an awesome next step as you pursue what it looks like to be a Christ-centered difference maker. I, uh, all right, hard pivot to what we're talking about. I've, I have been uh, listening to the Kelsey podcast uh, with Travis and Jason Kelsey, and I, I know that like Travis is the headline there, but not for me. I'm a Jason guy myself. Uh, yeah, because I'm an I'm a offensive lineman. And offensive lineman, we gotta stick together. And recently, he was talking about what he does, uh, he just retired, but what he used to do before every single practice, and it got me thinking that when I was a freshman in high school, I showed up to the first practice of football, and on the ground, there was these like little, basically we called them like boards that were on the ground, and as an offensive lineman, you stood in front of the board, you got in your stance, and you would just practice all of your steps. You'd practice like, ins like inside run, you practice zone steps, you put it backwards, you practice your kick slide, you practice your zone reach steps, and after like a few weeks of this, as a freshman, I was like, I got this figured out. Like we're probably not gonna keep doing this over and over and over again, and then we proceeded to do it over and over and over again for the next four years of high school football. First, first 10 minutes of every single practice, we would show up, we'd stand in front of these boards and we'd practice our steps. And then I got a chance to go play football in college and I was thinking like in college, every, these are all the best at what they're doing. We're gonna get to practice and we're gonna do something totally different. We're gonna mix it up. We're gonna learn something new. I remember getting to the first practice as a freshman in college and I run up to the field and those same boards are on the ground again. And I'm thinking like, wait, we're just gonna do this again? And for the next five years of my life, because I was a slow learner, I played college football, and every single practice for 10 minutes, we ran these boards. And I listened to Jason Kelsey talking about playing for the Philadelphia Eagles, and he says what he does at the beginning of every single practice is he puts these boards on the ground and he practices his steps. He's been doing this for 20 years playing football. He does the same thing every single day because the little things matter. Because it's, it's not good enough that I just know what I'm supposed to do. I have to make sure when, when it's time, when the ball is snapped, I take the correct steps and I practice. And this, this concept makes tons of sense in every area of life. We do, whether it's football or basketball, whether it's the job you're trying to get better or the hobby you like, whether it's math class or English class or when you go to college, like you're gonna keep practicing a thing to get better at it and better at it and better at it. That's how life works. Except for most of us, it doesn't seem to work like that at church. And it's crazy to me in church, there's this mindset that a lot of us have that as soon as we hear one thing on Sunday, I am paying attention to make sure I never hear that thing ever again for the rest of my life. I heard it, I understand it, I got it, we're moving forward. When the reality is we hear a thing and we move past it and we never actually do the work of applying it to our life. Doing the hard work of getting better at it. I mentioned last week, it's just the process of this fancy word called sanctification, looking more like Jesus. And a lot of us, myself included, we know enough. I don't need to know more stuff about Jesus. I, I know it. I need to be more obedient to what he calls me to do. And so we're, we're jumping into a series called Soundtracks for the next three weeks. And if you've been around, you may be saying, hey, Jake, I feel like we did this series last fall. And I would say to you, yeah. Glad you noticed, we did. It was called My New Playlist last fall. Adults did it, it was called Soundtracks. And I'm just so convinced that the premise 
of thinking about what you think about is the most important thing for us to do on a daily and a day-to-day basis to pursue Jesus, that it would be crazy for us to just hear it one time and move on. The kind of, the overarching, it's, it's just crazy to me that we do this all the time at church, and I'm just not gonna let it happen for us. We're, we're gonna dive in and we're gonna get better at it. And the overarching verse for this, this whole series is in Romans, and Paul's writing, he says, hey, this is in Romans 12, do not conform to the ways of this world. Paul calls us to look different than the world that is around us. If we raise our hand to be Christ-centered difference makers, we gotta look different. And he says right after it, here's how you look different. You transform your mind. You transform your mind. And so we're gonna spend time, these next three weeks, unpacking some tools to make us better at transforming our mind, thinking about what we think about. And I... I wanna just get into this for a second. If you were here last fall, you might remember some of these things, but I think this is super important to think about what we think about because the reality is your brain, your brain is a big old liar. Your brain lies to you all the time. It lies in three big ways. The first thing is your brain actually forgets its own memories. This is crazy, I heard about this. Uh, there was, a, I told us last year, you're gonna hear some of this, but the reality is there was the, the Challenger explosion that happened, this is in the 80s. They had a group of college students and right after it happened, the next day they had them write down, where were you, what happened, what were you wearing, what were you feeling? Seven years later, they brought these people back. Hey, write down, where were you at, what were you wearing, what were you feeling? 40% of them had totally different answers. And here's the crazy part. When they put their right answer in front of them, the people that had their, their memory had changed go, hey, that looks like my handwriting, but that can't be true. Because I remember it this way. Your brain's a liar. Your brain is lying to you. Think about what you think about. Another reason your brain's a liar is this idea that your brain confuses real and fake trauma. This is crazy to me. When a traumatic event happens in your life, your brain responds to it. Uh, if something big happens, there's a car accident, maybe your parents get a divorce, maybe someone close to you dies, that's a traumatic accident, like a thing, your brain responds. There was a study they did where everybody raised their hand to sign up for a, like just a test activity. In this test activity, people were socially rejected. And they knew this was gonna happen. It was an act, it was like they signed up for it, it was an experiment. People were socially rejected in a scenario they signed up to be in and they watched their brain and the people that were socially rejected knowing it was gonna happen. Their brain responded the same way to that fake trauma as it would do to real trauma. That's crazy. Your brain's a liar. Your your brain continues to lie to you because your brain actually wants to work really, really hard to tell you the easiest thing to remember. The best way to think about this, uh, the the way that your brain works is, uh, we used to have a dog, his name was Paco, and uh, Paco was a homie, what a, what a dude. And he in her backyard, he, we had like this little grass patch, it was mostly dirt, because I was a bad dad, uh, like father. Didn't have New Balance shoes yet, I was working on it. So I, anyways, so not a lot of grass, but in, in the backyard, our dog would go from our backyard to the front yard every single day just to bark at people because he was crazy. And over time, he wore a little path in our grass area. If you have dogs, you've probably seen this, where they just go over and over the same spot. It's the path of least resistance. Your brain does the same thing. It wants you to think about the stuff that's the easiest things to think about. So for instance, if let's say you were in charge of your younger brother for the weekend, your parents went out of town, and you were in charge of doing all the food for them, getting them ready, putting them to bed, and then getting them to school on Monday, and you did all that stuff and you crushed it, but you were like 10 minutes late for school, your brain would rather tell you, hey, you're a failure, you're not a good older sibling, than tell you, hey, you crushed it all weekend, your kid ate food, the house didn't burn down, you've done great things, you've been super helpful. Your brain's a liar. And the, re- the reality of lies is that it's, it's bigger than just lies. Because I think underneath that, lies are evil. John eight forty four says this, that the, the devil, Satan, he's the father of lies. And the way that he wants to change the way you think, I think that's the number one way that he's gonna pull you away from Jesus. And so we wanna take time to notice the lies that maybe have crept into what we believe and take some time together to fight back those lies. And this is not gonna be a series where I just get up here and like tell you crap. Like that's not helpful. We're gonna do one together every week, but then you're gonna go to your small group and you're gonna work together as a group to solve one of these things. 
to work at it, to put some like skin in the game, so to speak, because that's how we want to get better. I don't just want to like, what's the, the dumb thing with horses, teach them to fish or something? I don't know, that got that all screwed up. Uh, lead them to, what is it? Lead a horse to water, who knows it? Help me out, someone. What is it? You don't know it, do you know it? You just yell it. Yeah, you can't make it drink, that's not it. But that's we need, you guys get where we're going with this. We want to help it. Lead a horse to water, okay, whatever, I, I screwed that up. All right, anyways. Hey, we all got this. We all got one of these booklets and we all got a pencil and I need you to grab it and we're gonna work at this together and I'm gonna walk through one of these with you together. We're gonna do it and we're gonna walk out of here and you're gonna get a chance to do another one of these things. So I'm gonna jump right into this. I'm gonna get on my, uh, my little iPad. We're gonna write some things down. We're gonna do this together and this is what you have. This is, a, this is an image of what you're looking at. Once we get it, technology. The first thing we wanna do, we wanna work on identifying our thoughts. So this is kinda of what we're gonna to do together. I'm gonna to, I'm create a scenario and in a second, I want you to write down the first couple things that you feel as soon as I say this. So you have a, let's, let's do math. You have a math test coming up. Whoa, we got issues. Might have to unpack that next week. All right, so, hey, so you have a math test coming up. And you, you've studied for it. You've worked really hard. Like, you actually are more committed to doing well on this math test than you've ever been in the past. You show up to it. You take this math class, this math test, and you feel like you walk out of that and you feel like you crush it. You feel like you got a great score on this math test. You walk out of there, you feeling good, you studied, you prepared. Two days later, you come back to class, teacher throws it in front of you, 63%, 63%. Write down the first two or three thoughts you have. Write down the first two or three thoughts you have. Don't self-edit, just write it down. What do you think? What do you think? I don't know, my mom's gonna kill me. I was gonna kill me. I don't know, like what's the point of studying? There's a Y in there, I think. Some of you are like, hey, that's pretty good. Uh, 63, pretty good. <laughs> All right, <laughs> pretty good. Some of you are like, that's the best test I've ever done. That's, I'm killing it, dude, 63%. <laughs> I, I think if I were to burrow a little bit, I think you're, some of you might be thinking this. You might be thinking, hey, like I'm, a, like, I'm never gonna be able to figure this out. Like, I'm a failure. And so we've all, we've all written some things down and these feelings, these thoughts that come into our brain, those are real. We might not be able to change the first things that come into our brain, but I think what's important to then do is if you can, can you dig with me a little bit to figure out what's the thing beneath these thoughts? And it's one thing to feel something. What happens is when we feel something over and over and over again, what tends to happen is it turns into something that we actually believe. It turns into something we believe. And I, you, could, you could take your feelings that you wrote down, a lot of us wrote down a lot of different things, but if I could burrow to the, the bottom of it, I think for a lot of us, if we work really hard at something and we still don't do good at it, I think we, we feel like we failed. And I think the reason we feel like we failed is because at the core of this, what we believe about ourselves is that we need to be perfect. So from here on out, we're gonna, today we're gonna talk about this idea that we need to be perfect. And like some of you might relate with this more than others. Some of you, some of you are like, I don't ever think that. <laughs> That's okay, good for you. But some of you have this in your life where you feel the need to have to be perfect all the time. And once you have this like underlying soundtrack, we gotta decide if this soundtrack is something good or something that we need to remove. And here'd be the three questions I would ask. The first thing is this. Uh, is this soundtrack, is this thing true is the first thing. I need to be, I need to be perfect. Is it true? You know the answer to this probably. No, thanks one person, appreciate it. All right, no. All right, is it true, the sex, second one is this, is it kind to me or to other people? Is it kind that I think about myself that I have to be perfect every single time? Is that kind? 
No, it's setting you up, it's setting you up for failure. And the last one is this. Is it, I wanna raise things, is it helpful? Yes. And there is, is be, now I need to be perfect all the time, is it helpful? Someone said yes, and it, it could be kind of helpful. It might drive you to do really well. It might initially help you. But I think on the back end of it, it probably ends up not being helpful most of the time. But we'll just, we'll just do this. We'll do a maybe note for some of you, maybe it is a yes. Here, here's what would happen. When you go to small groups tonight and you unpack another one of these things and you get a no to any of these three answers or questions, to me that says that this is a broken soundtrack. This is something that isn't helpful and so we need to remove it. And if we wanna remove it, we wanna come down here and we wanna practice and think through replacing the soundtrack. And I'm gonna kinda of cook through this quickly but there are three things, three tips that I think would help you replace a good soundtrack. The first one is simply just this, it's called flip it. The reality, if you know that I need to be perfect isn't good, you could just flip that and that could be sticky and say like, I don't need to be perfect. That'd be easy. I don't need to be perfect. And when you feel that you have failed because you need to be perfect, you could just say to yourself, hey, I don't need to be perfect. Second way to do it is you could just steal something. Here's what I mean by this. Yeah, I know, right? Uh, look up the internet. You probably could find a quote of someone that has spoken about perfection. I literally just Googled perfection earlier, and this quote showed up from Mark Cuban, which, you know, pretty stand-up dude. Uh, and so he says, he says this. He says, perfection, I butchered the spelling of that, uh, is the enemy of success. Perfection is the enemy of success by Mark Cuban, Sir Mark Cuban. So you, you can flip your negative soundtrack, you could take something else, or the thing that we wanna talk about today that's the most helpful is we wanna do this. We wanna find scripture. The Bible talks about, there's a, there's a passage in the Bible that talks about putting on the armor of God, and it's, it's just like an allegory for things that matter in your life. And the one thing they talk about, the one offensive weapon that we have against the enemy is the sword of the spirit. And it really is talking about the idea of can we use scripture to remember what is true? It's, it's helpful to have these cool statements, to flip these statements, and it might be something that you wanna say to yourself all the time. But if it's not buried in the truth of what God says, then it's fleeting, it's not helpful. And so when, when you go to group, when you have a chance to unpack this, if you were around back in the spring, we did a series called Figure It Out where we actually asked you to find scripture. And I wanna do some of that today too for these next three weeks. But I, I found a few, few ahead of time for us, so I'm gonna help us out. Uh, I think it's important to think about what does, like believing that I need to be perfect, and this matters, what is that, like what does the Bible say about like what I am? And I think it says this. This is in Ecclesiastes 7. This is the message translation. There's not one totally good person on the earth. Not one who is truly pure and sinless. The reality of the soundtrack that you have that I need to be perfect is the Bible doesn't even say that's a reality. There isn't one person who is perfect. We can find another one right here too. Romans 3.23, you probably heard of this, for all have sinned. And fallen short of the glory of God. It's crazy how quickly, and I think this, this fascinates me when I talk about the idea of thinking about your thoughts. It's crazy how quickly the things that we believe crumble when you place them next to the truth of Scripture. And yet we say them over and over and over again because we've never actually tested them against the word of God. The Bible says this about the image of God, of who he is. This is in Psalms. It says this, as for God, his way is perfect. The Lord's word is flawless. He shields all who take refuge in him. I think if I were to, to, to pack all these thoughts into a sticky statement, the best I could do would be something like this. 
We, we have this idea where we have to be perfect. I think the reality is a new soundtrack for us could be something as simple as this. We could all hear this. I'm not perfect. But Jesus is. I'm not perfect, but Jesus is. Hey. Here, here's the reality. I, I, I struggle with this. Because I think a lot of us, when I just wrote that down, a lot of us do this, well, of course, Jake. Of course. Of course. Yeah, of course. I've known that my whole life. Yeah, but are you doing anything with that information? Like if you actually not just knew this in your brain, but believed it in your heart, It would, it would change the things that you think about yourself. It would change your reaction when you don't pass your driver's test, when you don't make the team, when something doesn't go the way that you want. I wonder if we moved this truth, this soundtrack, from just a thing we thought about to a thing that we believed. I wonder if it would stop the like spinning. I wonder if for a lot of us it would stop the anxiety that we feel. I, I really believe this. That the, the way Satan is gonna work in your life is to get you to believe things that aren't true. And oftentimes they're cloaked in things that seem good or seem helpful. But if you burrow into it a little bit, you realize that it, it's destructive to your life. And I would want nothing more than for us at the end of this series to have a booklet full of new soundtracks. That when something triggers in us a thought that we used to believe, we can recognize, hey, that isn't true. That isn't helpful. We can remove that, and then we can replace it with something that is good. And this last step, I'm not going to talk about it right now because you're going to go into your group and talk about it. But once you have a soundtrack that is new and good, you have to fight like crazy to repeat it. To say it over and over and over again. Because wouldn't it be cool, if we go back to my dog Paco, wouldn't it be cool if in our brain, the stuff that our brain wanted to say to us over and over and over again, wouldn't it be cool if that stuff wasn't lies? But wouldn't it be cool if that stuff was the truth? Let me pray for you guys. To me, Father, thank you for what you're doing in this space. Lord, forgive me for being a dude that just is so quick to hear something and move on from it. God, I'm just sick of knowing enough. I'm sick of thinking that I have all the answers. I want to be someone who loves Jesus and lives it out. us to not grow tired of doing the little daily things that move us towards Jesus. Removing us the negative attitude we feel when, when something, we talk about something that we've already heard. Allow me to be humble enough to realize that I need this soundtrack just as much as everyone here does. Jesus, you're good, and we love you. In your name, we're going to say amen.